you know, I may just pause again here and pray one more time. If you could just bow your heads where you are, and I'll <clears throat> kneel and pray again. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, as we want to right now spend some time in your word, I pray that you would speak to us. I pray that you would bless with your Holy Spirit to bring home to our hearts the message from this story in scripture. May it be real and practical and, and uh, really an encouragement to each one. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. His family could have easily attested to the fact that he was on his way out. Now, I don't mean like out of the family. I mean out of life. He was doing horribly. They saw one function after another leaving him. And now he was at a point where he could not even use his limbs. He was a mess. He was now a paraplegic and... Not only that, they saw their father and husband uh, deteriorating further, maybe a little gray tint in his skin or uh, even some places where it was rotting. I, I had a friend in Virginia, Paris Mitchell, who took care of patients who were long-term bedridden patients, and, and he had a business that... Uh, they would put in these, these beds that had air, uh, it was kind of like an air mattress, but it continually put air in it and it would come out. And so there was no pressure points. And he described one time he went and he was helping someone to clean out a bed sore. And he said his, his arm was in up to there just trying to get out the, the rottenness. And you know, in times like this that we're speaking of in the Bible times, I can imagine there was a mess like that in this man. He had tried all he knew. He even went to his religious leaders looking for some encouragement and some help, only to find a cold pronouncement that you are incurable. And we're going to leave you to the wrath of an angry God. He's mad at you. And you're just receiving the, the curse of God. He had lost all hope. He was dominated by remorse and guilt. He had brought it on himself, his family, and he knew that. He knew by his past life of sin he had brought this pain and guilt on himself and he was hopeless until his friends came to him. And they started telling him about a, a man named Jesus that he even healed lepers. I mean, if anyone is obviously being punished by God in their minds, it's a leper and he healed them. Maybe, maybe there's some hope for me. Well, they kept encouraging him as they reported about Jesus. They encouraged him, believe that if we can get you to him, into his presence, it's gonna work and you'll be healed. They kept at it. I don't know how long it took, but they encouraged him, and he started to get a little bit of a spark of that wonderful four-letter word that starts with an H, hope. He found some hope. It just started to flicker just a little bit, and right when he did, he remembered how this disease had come upon him. Wait a minute. I don't even deserve this. This is really kind of bringing the, I, I brought it on myself. But what he really desired was relief from his burden of sin, from the guilt. You know, guilt can so 
taint our lives. It can cause us to do things we otherwise would never have done or to keep us from doing things we absolutely should. It immobilizes us sometimes, guilt. And that's what he had. If only I could see Jesus and receive the assurance of forgiveness and peace somehow with heaven, I'd be content to live or to die. Doesn't matter then. If I could just have that peace. You know, some of us unnecessarily live without peace. I heard a story recently. Um, it didn't happen recently. It happened quite a while back. It was actually Jeff uh, Arthur who was sharing the story of a couple who were in a horrible blizzard and apparently a, a wreck on the road too. And this couple, I think they must have been trying to go to a safer spot or maybe it was in their car. I didn't get all the details. But the lady wrote a note that they found a few number of hours later. I don't want to die like this. And she and her husband actually froze to death in that car or in that place that night. And they realized when they found them, that couple was only six feet from a bus that had people in it that survived just fine. Six feet away. <laughs> we, don't have to, we don't have to suffer without peace, without peace with God. It's within reach if we'll ask. I'm going to be looking at Mark chapter 2 with you, verses 1 through 12, and a beautiful story, a picture of a loving Savior who's powerful and longs, longs, not, well, maybe, longs to heal our deepest needs. Go with me to the story that we find in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 and following says, and again, he entered into Capernaum. Capernaum became a special place for Jesus. It was a place where when he went, people listened. That was one of the ones where, wow, lots of things happened because people actually believed in him and opened themselves to him. By God's grace, let's make, nah, let's let the Lord make this place a Capernaum where there isn't one sickness, sin sickness that is left because Jesus came and healed all. So he's back to Capernaum, special place, after some days, and it was noise that he, he was in the house. Interesting, in the house. <laughs> he was in a house there and straightway, many were gathered together wouldn't you want to be there hearing the things about him? There were many gathered. Insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. They couldn't even see through the door. It was crowded around too, or the windows if they had some. And he preached the word unto them. You know, whenever, whenever we gather around Jesus, the thing that helps us is the word. He sends his word to heal them. He said, my word is spirit and it's life. It works. That's why he uses it. That's why he preached it. That's why he would have us spend time ourselves in his word. In fact, it's interesting Adding to this a little bit, Luke 5, 17 says, the power of the Lord was present to heal. It used that little phrase, the power of the Lord was present to heal. And it was, Jesus was there. And look at verse 3 then. 
No, I want to pause for a moment here. Well, no, I will, I'll, let me read uh, three. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. So these friends that I mentioned earlier that had reported about Jesus and encouraged his faith are the ones that kept on, kept on encouraging and helping. Do you realize how much we have an influence on each other? And how much we need to have an influence on each other? If you have tasted of the peace that Jesus gives, keep encouraging everyone so that nobody's left behind, that they find that peace in God. So here they are. They've now been brought uh, it's interesting in the book Desire of Ages it brings out some details of these, of these things it mentioned that it was the, the paralyzed man who said let's go let's go can you guys take me can you carry me there I can't even get to him on my own can you take me what do you think they said well, I don't know I've got a lot to do what yeah Yes, let's do it. Let's, they were eager to do it. They had been encouraging this. It, he was finally coming to the point of what they'd been seeking to get him to do and encourage him to do all this time. So they did. They brought him there. And then it says, <clears throat> when they could not come nigh unto him for the press for the crowd that was there pressing in to Jesus, they uncovered the roof. But I'm gonna stop there just for a minute and back up. They found it impossible to get to Jesus. Isn't it odd, numerous times in the Bible, that the crowd around Jesus causes somebody who wants to get to him to be impeded and barricaded from getting to him? Isn't that sad? Isn't it sad that sometimes by attitudes, by other things, we who are wanting to encourage others by what we do and say and how we act, we actually discourage or press back those who are trying to get to Jesus too. Now in this crowd, it was a mixed multitude for sure. Apparently different nationalities and you saw some who were eager. You saw some that were just curious. Wow, everyone's here, what's going on? They were just seeing what was happening. There, was others who were, there were others who were eager and reverent, and there were some that were unbelieving. Others, like the Pharisees and the doctors of the law, as it says, they were there just to see if they could find something to say, aha, that proves you are not the Messiah. And so we can keep everyone following us and not continuing to go and follow you. We want our power back, our political power. It's interesting in Luke chapter 1, verse 53, the Bible says, He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. Here was a crowd, a mixed multitude, those who wanted something, and they were getting something, and those that were not exactly looking for anything except maybe trouble or curiosity, and they did not receive a thing. Again and again, these four men were trying to carry him in, and they tried, you know, let me try this door, let me try over here. And they kept trying, and it's like nobody would part the way. It's like, no, no, I, I, no, no, maybe over there. I, I gotta listen. They would not allow them in. The sick man, get this, he's laying there in whatever they're taking him on. He's looking around in unutterable anguish, kind of like, no way, this is my only hope. Oh man, what's going on? And he's just distraught. People see it, but it's kind of like with many, they don't care. And they're not letting him in. But he has got, you know, every step, every effort toward Jesus actually builds our faith in him, even if we haven't found him yet. It's Jesus who was drawing him through the Holy Spirit. Jesus knew he was on his way. 
I wonder if he must have known through the Holy Spirit that how he was going to come down. That'd be interesting. You wonder if he kept looking up about that time? <laughs> well, what he did. Uh, so, so there they are, and, and the man on the couch, as, the, as, as King James says it, on the stretcher there, he says, you know what? I am not going to take no for an answer. I'm getting to Jesus. He's my only hope, and there's nobody that's going to stand between me and getting to him. And so he says, how about the roof? Take me up there. They said, okay. And they take him on up. Get up on that roof. Apparently, there were some beams and some thatch and then some, some mud clay that had hardened on top and made a pretty decent roof. And they'd go up there sometime to... Uh, when it wasn't too hot, I guess. And they were up there. Oh, wait. Now how do we get to Jesus? And I don't imagine they brought tools with them with that in mind. So I imagine they were using these. Los manos? Right? <laughs> they were using their hands. They, were, they, were, they started digging that apart for their buddy that they've been praying for, encouraging, helping. And he's now like, I'm not gonna take no for an answer. Take that roof apart, whatever it takes, get me to Jesus. And sure enough, they pull it apart. Let him down in there. Now I can imagine from inside, you know, there's dust and there's pieces of thatch and who knows what all else coming down, all the dust. I can imagine that room, you know, it's like when you're sweeping out a dusty room, you know, it's <laughs> and I can, I can imagine it's like that, and, and Jesus stops his sermon. You're not going to keep talking through when the, one time we were, uh, oh, I better not do that. <laughs> Never mind. No. Nah. Sometimes you got to say no to yourself, you know. Uh, so there they are. He's pulling it apart. They let him down in. The sermon stops, and everybody's eyes are on this guy. And what's Jesus going to do with this guy? Now, they know him. Oh, that's him. That's, that's the sinner. He, he's punished by God. He's got to be a bad sinner. Stuff he's gone through. And there he is. And let's read the rest of what it says here. Broken up, let them let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw whose faith? Their faith. The four that let him down, as well as the one on that stretcher there. When he saw their faith, do you realize what it does for each other if we're praying for each other? We need to pray for each other. Lift each other up. We're so... <laughs> We're real good at praying with an E. And sometime we, you know what I mean by that? P-R-E-Y? You got that? You know, doing things against, talking against someone behind their back or whatever, when we need to be heavy in prayer with an A, that we are praying for them. But here they are, Jesus said he saw, it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, son, oh, I like that, son, I, I'm like your, your father. I, I'm gonna be family with you, son. And, and Matthew adds this. You see, when he's let down, remember I said his unutterable anguish, he's just like, no, I, this is my only hope. And then he goes up there and he's wondering, is this going to work out? I think it is. His faith has been built up by every effort toward Jesus. And now he says, son, and Matthew chapter 9, verse 2, adds this little phrase, be of good cheer. You know what? Don't. Don't worry right now, because I'm getting ready to tell you the best news you've ever heard. It's the deepest need you have right now, and I'm, I'm going to take care of it. Be of good cheer. What does he say then? Thy sins be forgiven thee. You're forgiven, man. That was his biggest burden, the guilt. And he took it away. 
And we are told that if, he, it had, if this story stopped there and they had to pull him back up the roof and take him back home and he laid there and died in two months, he'd have been happy. He'd have been content because they got the biggest problem taken care of. But Jesus doesn't do things part way, neither does he do things without a reason and a purpose. He started that way and it was the, the biggest need. He was also making an object lesson to the rest. We'll read the rest of the story here. Um, but you know that, that gentleman simply accepted Jesus' words. He said, your sins be forgiven you. And he accounted that as, well, oh, praise the Lord. It's true. I accept that as truth for me. Jesus said it. I believe it. And it was true. So we go on. Uh, verse 6. But there, was a certain, uh, there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, why reason ye these things in your hearts? I know what you're thinking. He did know what they were thinking. Sometimes we try to, be, we try to read each other's minds when we shouldn't. But he knew, I know what you're thinking. And then he says, now tell me, which is easier to say to the sick of the palsy? Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise, take up thy bed and walk? Which is either easier to prove? Should I, I, you know, someone can just go around saying, hey, man, your sins are forgiven, buddy. But how, how do you know that's the case? So he said, okay, which is, which is easier, to say that? Or how about let me prove to you my power and ability to heal in a physical realm so, so you will know what I just said and he just got is for real. And he goes on. He, go, uh, he it says, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise, take up thy bed and go thy way into thy house. And I love the way Mark so often he uses this, um, immediately. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all. You know, he didn't say, uh, fellas, can you pull me back up through? This time they're parting for him. <laughs> uh, he's the center stage and they're all watching and they're just like, I think heaven just came down. And it had. Jesus showed them, wow, look what I can do if you'll let me. He walks through that crowd now and he went forth before them all insomuch as that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw it on this fashion. We've never seen this before. This is, this is different. This is supernatural. Would you like to hear the rest of the story when he went home? Do you know we have that story? In the Desire of Ages, let me read it to you quickly and we're gonna to come to a close. In the home of the healed paralytic, there was great rejoicing when he returned to his family, carrying with ease the couch upon which he had been slowly born from their presence, but a short time before. So he's back in not too long a time and they're like, Wow, dad, husband, whoa. They gathered round with tears of joy, scarcely daring to believe their eyes, probably pinching themselves. Wait a minute, wait a minute, am I awake? Is this a dream? No way. They, uh, he stood before them in the full vigor of manhood, 
Those arms that, had been, that it, they had seen lifeless were quick to obey his will. The flesh that had been shrunken and leaden-hued was now fresh and ruddy. He walked with a firm, free step. Joy and hope were written in every liniment of his countenance and, ex and an expression of purity and peace had taken the place of the marks of sin and suffering. Glad thanksgiving went up from that home and God was glorified through his son who had restored hope to the hopeless and strength to the stricken one. This man and his family were ready to lay down their lives for Jesus. How about that? No doubt dimmed their faith. No unbelief marred their fealty or faithfulness to him who had brought light into their darkened home. Isn't that beautiful? Do you know that your life, if it's not like this, can be? You have a Savior who's powerful and longs to heal you, to give you that peace that they found. You know, some of you, you know who you are, and the Lord knows who you are, even though no one else here does. But some of you, in some ways, are captive to habits and challenges in your secret life that make you sometimes feel like this man, hopeless, I'll never get over this. I can't get beyond it. And Jesus looks to you tonight. If you receive his word, he says, thy sins be forgiven you. You know who you are. And you can receive that from him. And then that peace that comes into your life when that guilt is behind you. And yes, he has got to be the one to continue the work that only he can begin. But it can be from a context of peace and giving all to him. And then like that man and his family, Lord, I will give you anything you need in my life. I wanna to give to you anything that stands between me and you. He'll take it, and he'll give you strength to do what you could never do on your own. Are you walking in the light? Do you have peace? Do you know that you are right with Jesus, or are you lacking these things? And if you are, he's here, present here for you today to say your sins be forgiven you, if you'll accept that. Confess it, give it to him, and find strength and peace so that he can bring light to every dark corner of your heart and life. That's his love for you, and he's powerful to do it. Let's kneel together as we pray, and I wanna give you an opportunity as I pray to uh, to accept this appeal from Jesus to you, will you let me forgive you? Will you let me put power in your life so that you can take up that bed, take up that thing that seems to be the symbol of your weakness and give it over to him? Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, as we come before you this evening, I just thank you for for your word that is powerful. That as Jesus said, my words to you are spirit and life. And Lord, I pray that you would help each one of us here. If any of us find ourselves like that man, seeming hopeless because of the past, because of the present bondage or spiritual maladies, sicknesses, that we feel hopeless. Lord, I just thank you that you are here. You are powerful. 
and long to heal our deepest needs. And Lord, I just want to give opportunity to anyone here tonight and everyone here tonight that wants to say to you, Lord, I want to reach up to receive your forgiveness, to trust you with my life, and to take up my bed and walk with you. I invite you to raise your hand right now. All right, I see some hands. Anyone else want to raise your hand to reach up to him, to say, yes, I want to receive your forgiveness. I want to receive power from you to live a new life in Christ. Lord, I thank you for each one. You've seen each hand. You know each heart. And I know that when we look at ourselves and we look at our challenges, it is hopeless. But I thank you that we don't have to look there. We can look to you and find strength and help and power. So, Lord, I pray for that for each of us in our experience, that at the beginning of this year right now, that you would work in each of us to find a personal, powerful Savior in Jesus. May that be our, the reality. And, Lord, as we've lifted our hands to say, yes, we want to receive this from you, thank you that you're doing that, and you will continue to work that in us. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.